So after taking a look at what happened in Russia, the second major revolution that we're going to address is Mexico. And of the big three, you know, you got Russia, China, Mexico. Mexico was actually the first all the way back in 1910. Now, Mexico spent the greater portion of the 1800s really struggling for stability. They declared their dependence from Spain in 1821, but they lost Texas and half of their territory to the United States in the first half of the 19th century. This would be the U.S.-Mexican War. Inspired by the so-called revolutions of 1848 that were breaking out across Europe, the La Reforma movement sought to stem the power of the Caudillos. And basically, a Caudillo is a citizen soldier, or I should say a soldier politician, along the lines of Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna. They wanted a more liberal nation. Benito Juarez was elected the first Amerindian president in the country's history, and in 1857, he helped alter the Mexican Constitution. The privileges of the Catholic clergy and military were restricted, and a new Bill of Rights ended the old Costa system by making everyone equal before the law. Now, these reforms angered conservatives, especially ones that seized church land and restricted clergy rights. Many bishops are going to ally themselves with the large haciendas on opposing liberal reforms. Now, the infighting between these factions opens up the door for the French Emperor Napoleon III to send in troops in 1861, and he's really going to try to resurrect the French Empire in the Americas. On May 5th, 1862, a small Mexican force defeated a much larger French force at the Battle of Puebla, which is now celebrated as Cinco de Mayo. But conservative forces eventually allowed the French to take over Mexico City. And this was the second invasion and takeover of their capital in under 15 years. U.S. pressure forced the Mexicans uh, to kick the French forces out officially. All right, the French physically withdrew, but liberal and conservative forces are gonna battle for the future of Mexico for decades. Porforio Diaz, came to power in 1876, and he ruled like an old-school caudillo, ignoring the freedoms that La Reforma had fought for. But he did believe in free trade and foreign investment in the nation. Foreign companies from the United States and Great Britain invested in railroads and large-scale agriculture, hindering the lives of self-sufficient farmers. They also increased the power of the national state government you know, the Mexican state, because more railroads increased access to the entire country. Now, Porforio Diaz is really going to remain in charge the rest of the 1800s due to the fact that he won rigged election after rigged election. But a new generation of middle-class Mexicans are going to want an end to the political monopoly held by Diaz. Diaz will eventually flee to Europe, and Francisco Madero will be elected president in 1910. This is why we often consider 1910 to be the start of the revolution. Madero takes office, and he's assassinated in 1913. Now, the government, led by a more liberal man named Carranza, instituted a new constitution in 1917. Unfortunately, his two partners of the revolution, Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, turned against him. Zapata was assassinated by Carranza's agents in 1919. Carranza himself was killed in 1920, and Villa was killed three years later. You know, up to two million people were killed in the revolution by the time that order is restored in 1929. Political assassination is deeply embedded within the nation's history. And the Constitution itself employed a legal framework that protected private property, but it also enshrined workers' rights, it restricted the Catholic Church, and it identified the mineral sector as belonging to the nation. The phrase, private property is a privilege created by the nation, is not only in this new Constitution, but it provides the impetus 
for nationalizing the nation's natural resources and eventually redistributing land. Now the church pushed, uh, pushed back on these reforms and the chaos continues as we'll see for another decade. The party of the Mexican Revolution stabilized the nation. All right, but even at that, this new political party, which forms as, you know, a new union of rival factions, they're going to use corruption, patronage, and backroom deals to run the country. And these leaders, some of them at least, are clearly going to care more about personal gain than in governing the nation. And by taking the competing factors and turning them into one formal party, they're going to sap the revolution of much of the energy that had propelled earlier change. 